And there we are, Facebook Live. All right, y'all, Prophet David Taylor here. Uh, here on my second Thursday night program. My second Thursday night program is called, let me make sure. I'm in the middle. My second Thursday night program is called No More Genies. Okay, No More Genies. And that comes from the idea of getting rid of the genie concept of God. Okay, so we're going to get rid of our genie concept of God and replace it with real faith based on actual scripture from the word of God. Okay. All right. Let's start with a quick word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this evening. Thank you, Lord. We invite you in. We invoke you in. Oh, God, we know that prayer does not inform God. Prayer invites God. Lord, we need you. You're the one with the knowledge. You're the one with the, with the wisdom, with the power. You are God all by yourself, and we are just creatures of clay and breath. So we need you, oh, God, to come in the midst of this and be in the midst of this time and let your words flow out of my mouth and let be spoken what you want spoken. And uh, we want you to do that, Lord, that you might be glorified, that the saints might be edified, and that the demons might be terrified. And we thank you for it. We believe you for it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Amen and amen. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to give you a lot of information, as always. So you're going to need to watch this video more than once. Okay. So what is my tagline? My tagline is that God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to the prophets. And how do you test a prophet? Deuteronomy 18.22. What he says has to come true or come to pass, or you don't have to listen to it because it isn't from the Lord. Boom. <laughs> all right. So welcome to all my audiences. Welcome to my Facebook Live audience. Welcome to my Periscope audience. Welcome to my YouTube uh, audience. Uh, thank you for those of you that are watching live. Thank, thank you to those of you that are watching the replay. Please like and share. Please like this video and share it as many places as you can, because when God gives a prophetic gift and when God gives a prophetic word, it's designed to bless nations, it's designed to bless millions, it's designed to echo down through time. That's what the Bible is. Words spoken many thousand years, many thousands of years ago, still echoing down through time and blessing us now. So please share this video in as many places as you can, because it's designed to bless millions and change nations. If you want to support me, I have a paypal.me uh, link on my Facebook Live and also my Periscope profile and my Twitter feed. Also, you can shop on my Amazon Smile link where a portion of what you spend will be donated to not, my not-for-profit, Prophet David Taylor, which is a 501c3, uh, which means the donations are tax-deductible. Uh, this year, I'm going to be getting uh, some new apps. I'm going to get Zelle and probably Cash App because I've had some people say, they would like to donate that way, so I am going to upgrade to that, and I will let you know. And for those of you that have supported me, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. And if you look at my ministry videos, you see what I'm out there doing, uh, you know, when I'm out there uh, doing ministry other than my videos. Okay? How and where to find me? I always hashtag everything with hashtag PDT. So that's how you can look me up. My regular broadcast is Sundays, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, and then second Thursday night, which is tonight, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. So I'm on every week on Sunday and then once a month on second Thursday with my No More Genies teaching, okay? All right, so our topic tonight is Save My Marriage, Part 1, because I'm just getting started and I'm just scratching the surface. Save My Marriage, Part 1. There's a lot of groundwork I have to lay first, okay? And then I have to lay a lot of groundwork just to get to the first choke point. Okay, so again, you're going to have to watch this video multiple times. So let's jump right in. First part of the groundwork I need to lay is you need to understand what situation you're in. There are four laws that God has established, four laws that govern all of creation. And they are the way that God set creation up. And if you don't understand those four laws, because they don't just apply to us humans, they apply to every creature that God created. Think about it. Uh, uh, Light-bearing uh, entities, sun, moon, stars, novas, comets, constellations, angels, insects, plants, uh, land animals, birds, fish, and us humans too. These four laws I'm going to show you don't just apply to us. They apply to every single thing that God made. So if you don't understand the four laws, you're in trouble. So that's why I need the latest foundation, okay? So our scripture reference for the first three, and then there's going to be another scripture for number four. Our scripture reference is Deuteronomy 
chapter 30, verse 19. So I'm going to read that for you. Deuteronomy is uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the fifth book in the Bible, the fifth book in the Old Testament, first part of the Bible, written by Moses, um, called the Torah by the Hebrews, called the Pentateuch by us Gentiles. Okay, Deuteronomy, because I know it's a funny sounding word, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. Out of the Berean Study Bible, it says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. So choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Out of the King James, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Okay, we're going to get our first three laws from that scripture. So law number one. Law number one is that we have a choice. Now remember, us humans, it's not just us that have a choice, because the angels had a choice. That's how Lucifer became the devil. The stars have a choice. The sun has a choice. Birds have a choice. Plants have a choice. When Jesus walked up to the fig tree, Jesus said, I like some figs. And the fig tree said, oh, I ain't got no figs. And then he cursed it. Okay, when God called the whale to swallow Jonah, that whale had to answer God and go pick up the prophet. Everything God made has a choice, not just us humans. Okay, we have a choice between life or death, good or evil, blessing or cursing, not neutral. <laughs> there is no neutral switch. Haven't you ever heard people say, well, I don't believe in God, and then they just walk away. Like that makes God go away. There's no abstain. You can't abstain from this. There's no neutral. I know we don't like it, but we have to choose, okay? You can have life or death. You can have as much of either as you want. You can have life in your mind, life in your body, life in your finances, life in your marriage, life in your spirit, life in your relationships, life in your career, or you can, have, or you can even have eternal life and stay attached to God forever. Or you can have death. You can have death in your mind, death in your words, Death in your emotions, death in your body, death in your relationships, death in your money, death in your career. You can even have eternal death and become detached from God forever. Okay? You can have as much of either as you want, life or death, but you got to choose. There is no abstain. There is no neutral. There is no, I don't believe in all that. You got to choose. That's law number one. Okay, here come law number two. Every choice has a consequence and you're going to get locked in it. Okay, so number one, law number one is you got the freedom to choose as much life or death as you want. But law number two is every choice has a consequence and you're going to get locked in it. You know that old saying, you are what you eat? That's true. Your body, your cells rebuild themselves based on your diet. So every piece of food and drink you put in your mouth affects you, okay? Every choice has a consequence, and you're going to get locked in it. We don't have a problem with that when it's a good harvest. Like if you went back to school, and you worked really hard for four or five years, and you graduated with a degree. You, that degree is yours forever. Nobody can take that from you. You don't have a problem with that. But let's say, God forbid, we fill ourselves full of alcohol, and we climb behind the wheel of a car, and then we have an accident, and somebody's dead because of us. Then you have to live with that. You can work through it. You can get past. There can be forgiveness and healing. But you, you would get locked into the consequences of our choices. That is a law of God. That's why you can't be listening to people that tell you that there are no consequences. That's not true. You're going to get locked in them. Okay? Law number two. Here come law number three. Your actions affect other people starting with your descendants. One more time. Your actions affect other people, starting with your descendants. So in other words, law number one, you have a choice between life or death, good or evil, blessing or cursing. Law, law number two, your actions have consequences and you're going to get locked in them. But law number three is that your actions affect other people, starting with your, your descendants, your children, your family. You do not live in a vacuum. I know especially now, I know people are watching me from all over the world. But us Westerners, us Americans, we're raised on the rights of the individual. 
So that's why America's always talking about rights and me and I and my rights. But you do not live in a vacuum that is not actually the setup of life, <laughs> okay? You were not created in a vacuum. It took your father and your mother and God to create you. You weren't born in a vacuum. You don't exist in a vacuum. And you don't die in a vacuum. Even when you die, somebody has to take care of your corpse and put you in the ground or scatter your ashes to the wind. You don't exist in a vacuum. So your actions are going to affect other people, starting with your descendants, starting with your children, whether you like it or not. So when you hear people screaming about how it just is my life, it just affects me, that's garbage. Okay? That is not the law of God. That's them just doing that. Okay? And now we have to go to law number four. We have to look at a different scripture for law number four. Law number four is found in Matthew 12, 36. Matthew, first book of the Old, uh, excuse me, New Testament. First book of the New Testament, Matthew. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Matthew. First book of the New Testament. Chapter 12, verse 36, out of the Berean Study Bible. But I tell you that men will give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. Whew. New Living Translation. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. Whew. King James Bible. But I say unto you, this is Jesus talking, but I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And there is law number four, that we have to give an account. I know we don't like it, but it's what the Lord said is going to happen. Okay? So let's review the situation we're in through the four laws. Law number one, we have a choice, life or death, blessing or cursing, good or evil. You can have as much of either as you want, but you've got to choose. Number two, Every choice has a consequence, and you're going to get locked in it. You're going to have to live with what you choose. Law number three, your actions affect other people, starting with your descendants. And law number four, you must give an account. You're going to answer whether you like it or not, okay? This is the situation that we're in, not just us humans. Everything God made bows down to them four laws. That's why Lucifer became Satan. That's why angels became demons. Because they had a choice. Once they chose to rebel against God, they got locked in it and became demons. Once they got locked in it and became demons, they affect life on earth now because they always run around trying to get us to choose death. And number four, they have to give an account, which is why all those demons that were in Legion, when they saw Jesus, they fell down. They said, we know who you are. Are you here to torment us before the time? So in other words, demons know there's going to come a day where God's going to make them answer for everything that they've done. They know that. See what I mean? So it's not just us humans. Everything God made, if the sun got an attitude with God and said, well, I don't want to shine no more, God would snatch it out of the sky and make another one. Because you've got to answer. Okay? So this is the situation you're in, whether you like it or not, whether you understand it or not, whether you think that's fair, fair, whether you think it's fair or not, you are not the inventor. This is the situation that you're in. Well, Prophet Taylor, what does that have to do with marriage? I'm going to tie it together. I'm going to show you. Okay? So that's our foundation, them four laws. Okay? So, now, before we get into what marriage is, I have to spend some time telling you what marriage is not. And one more time. Before we get into what marriage is, I have to spend some time telling you what marriage is not. Very, very important because marriage is not what we think it is. A lot of people are like, well, I want my marriage to be saved. Well, I want my marriage to be better. I want, want. okay, well, then I have to lay some foundation. And before I tell you what it is, I have to tell you what it's not. So, under this heading, again, the, the, the subject line is, marriage is not what we think it is. Okay? And I'm going to give you six things we think it is. Here's thing number one. Thing number one is, when you got married, you thought you bought yourself a servant. You thought that because you went to the, to the clerk county's office and got a certificate, got a license, and because you rented out a hall or rented out a church, and spend all that money on that very expensive ceremony, you think that means you bought yourself a servant. 
How do I know that's true? Because you think that once you get married that they have to do what you say. And they have to do what you say according to your specifications. You think that they can be easily and quickly fired. If they don't do what you want, I'll just get another one. Okay? You also, a lot of people listen to me, listen to me now, you have your spouse on minimum wage. What do I mean by minimum wage? You're giving them just enough sex. You're giving them just enough conversation, just enough attention. You're giving them the bare minimum that they need to function in the relationship. Some of y'all have sex maybe twice a year, and out of that input, you expect them to give you full benefits and their best effort in return. You got them on minimum wage. Sex twice a year, but they got to go out and work all day and bring you home all the money and give you fidelity and faithfulness. With sex twice a year, that's minimum wage. Some of y'all got your spouses on minimum wage on attention. You don't talk to them unless you want something. <laughs> Don't ask them how their day is. Don't want to have a conversation. Don't want to spend any private time with them. You just talk to them when you want something. That's minimum wage. I'm not going to pay attention to you till I want something. That's minimum wage. Because you think they're your servant. Okay? And some of y'all uh, have them on minimum wage in affection. Oh, man. Like, like your husband or your wife, you know, you can't hug them. You, you don't have a good, kind word to say. Maybe you don't have a smile. You know, maybe like once a quarter you smile at them. That's minimum wage. But in return for that, what you expect is for them to work all day, bring you home all the money, and be faithful in, in the face of that little minimum wage input that you've given them. Man or woman, woman, husband or wife, if everybody's working, whatever your situation, you give them a little minimum wage input and in return for that, you think they're supposed to ignore everybody else, go and work all day, bring you home all the money, and blah, 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 blah. Give them, they're supposed to give you their best effort in return for your little minimum wage input. Because you think that you bought yourself a servant. That's what we think marriage is, but that ain't what marriage is. Mm -hmm. That's just number one. Here come number two. When you got married, you think you bought yourself a slave. A slave is different from a servant. How do I know that we think we bought ourselves slaves when we get married? Well, number one, what's the number one defining quality of a slave? A slave has no rights. A slave is property, not a person. Slaves are property, not people. That's the number one defining characteristics of slaves. And a whole lot of people, when they get married, you think you bought yourself a slave. You think they're your property and they're not a person. How do I know that? How can I make a statement like that? Okay. How do you treat like slaves? <clears throat> Number one, you humiliate them. You wait until you get into the mall and then cause a scene. <clears throat> Y'all been sitting home together all weekend. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then Monday, y'all go to the mall, and then you go off in public because you're trying to humiliate them. Or you wait until you get to the house of God. Y'all been home Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Then you wait till Sunday morning. You get in the church, and then you just start going off right outside the church, right in the hallway, right wherever you are because you're trying to humiliate them because you think you got a right to humiliate them because you think you bought yourself a slave when you got married. How else do we treat slaves? You give them the absolute leftovers because how you feed slaves is you feed your family and the kids first and then the scraps you might give to the dogs. And then if there's any scraps from the scraps, you give them to the slaves. That's how a lot of people treat their spouses. You're just giving them scraps. You're giving your best in other areas of your life. You're giving your best to other people. You're giving your first fruits. Now, I'm not talking about God's first fruits because that always belongs to God. I'm not talking about God's first fruits. I'm talking about your first fruits after we've given God what is his due. You're giving your first fruits to everybody else and everything else but your marriage, and you bring them the scraps. And in return for your scraps, you expect them to give you their best because they don't have any rights because you think they're your slave. Okay? How else do we treat slaves? You starve them. 
Now, minimum wage is when you're giving them just enough. But when you think you bought yourself a slave, you starve them. Stay, slaves are, are starved all the time. And y'all, some people listen to me right now, you're starving your husband or your wife for sex. You're starving them for attention. You're starving them for finances. You're starving them for affection. And you're starving them for conversation. You're starving them. Do you know why you're starving them? Because you think you have a right to. Well, because we married. No, you think you bought yourself a slave. And you think that in return for your starvation technique that they're supposed to give you their best in return. That's what slaves are like. Okay? And lastly, how else do we treat slaves? We beat them. I know, I know that's always going to be a touchy subject. Me, an African-American man. I'm also Native American, by the way. Talking about slavery. That's one of the ugly stepchildren of America. But it's still a reality. Because slaves in this country got beat to death. Beat within an inch of their life. Beat until they back rope. Beaten. Lynched. Okay? We beat them. And that's the way a lot of people treat their husbands and their wives. You verbally beat them. You just like your mama. You just like your daddy. Uh-huh. I knew you wasn't no good when I married you. Uh-huh. You so lazy. Uh-huh. You're their spouse. You're their husband. Or you're their wife. And you line up every day verbally to beat them. To tell them how wrong they are, how much they need to change, everything that's wrong with them in their life. You beat them. Okay? You beat them verbally. You also beat them physically. Now, I don't care what anybody says. I check the statistics because I do research for myself. Okay? Because I'm not a follower. <laughs> okay? I do research for myself. I found out that when it comes to domestic violence, domestic violence is split right down the middle. 50% of domestic violence is initiated by women. 50% of domestic violence is initiated by men. And, uh, oh, excuse me, 25%. 25% initiated by women. 25% initiated by men. And the other 50% is spouses going at each other. It's mutual. So one quarter of domestic violence is started by women. One quarter of domestic violence is started by men. And the other 50% are just husbands and wives going at each other. So I don't care what anybody says. I don't care how people try to spin that in the media because I did the research for myself. Do you know why we get physical with our spouses? Because they won't do what you want them to do. So you decide to beat them. Do you know why you beat them? Because you think you have a right to. Because you think when you got married, you bought yourself a slave. Now they won't do what I want them to do. So I'm going to beat them until they do. Okay? That's what we think marriage is. That is not what marriage is. Okay, so number one, you think you bought yourself a servant. Number two, you think you bought yourself a slave. Here come number three. We think that marriage is a personality cure. <laughs> we think that marriage is a personality cure all. Okay, we think that, okay, so number one under this one, we think that they gonna fix you. We think that going to the county clerk's office and buying a license and getting a pastor to sign that license and renting out the hall or the church and paying for that expensive ceremony means they're going to fix me. <laughs> so all my, See, because we married. <laughs> so all my insecurities, all my low self-esteem, my self-hatred, the failures of my parents, you bring all that and you dump it right at the feet of your spouse. Because you think that because, well, see, we married, Prophet Taylor. No, no, see, we married. That means you think that they were going to fix you. Okay, my daddy didn't love me, so now you have to make up for that. My father never told me I was pretty, so now you got to tell me I'm pretty. My mother was never there. I never knew a mother's love, so now you have to make up for that. You think they're going to fix you. <laughs> you think that whatever was wrong with you and whatever was going on in your life, you think, but now we may, I just want to get married. So now you think that because you're married, that it's a personality cure that your spouse is going to fix you. But that is not what marriage is. That's just what we think it is. Okay? The flip, number two on the, under this subheading, we got to flip it, and that is, you think you're going to fix them. If you don't think your spouse is going to fix you, you bless it sure think you're going to fix them. You think they just need a little time under your control and with your manipulation and your witchcraft, you think you're going to make them be all right. Uh-huh. You are an arrogant idolatrous blasphemer. Does it sound like I stuttered? 
You are an arrogant, idolatrous blasphemer that puts yourself above the maker as if you invented them. You didn't invent men. You don't know how we're supposed to be. Show me the blueprints where you drew up masculinity and I'll stop talking. You didn't invent women. You don't know how women are supposed to be. Show me the blueprints where you drew up females and I'll stop talking. You didn't invent marriage. You didn't invent sexuality. You didn't invent love. You didn't invent children. But you think you're going to fix them with your mind control and your witchcraft. Because you think, well, I know what's wrong with them. They need to be this way and they need to be that way. According to who? Did you stand over their mom while their mom was pregnant with them and decide their eye color? Did you decide how tall they were going to be, how much athletic ability they were going to have, how much musical talent if they, they were going to have, if any, how long they were going to live, their skin tone? Did you decide any of that? See, the Bible says that God does that. Psalm 139, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God is knitting us together in our mother's womb while our mothers are pregnant with us. That's God's job. And here you come because you think you married somebody that you're going to fix them because they need to be like this. According to who? Did you invent them? Do you have the blueprints? Show me the blueprints and I'll stop talking. You're not going to fix them because you didn't invent them. You didn't invent men. You didn't invent women. You didn't invent children. You didn't invent sex. You didn't invent love. You didn't invent marriage. And you did not invent your spouse. You did not invent them. But here you come with your arrogant, idolatrous witchcraft thinking that you're going to fix them. That is not what marriage is. That's just what we think it is. Okay? All right. So that was three. You think you bought yourself a servant. You think you bought yourself a slave. You think marriage is a personality cure. Here come number four. Number four of what, mar what we think marriage is. We think marriage is a ticket to happily ever after. Oh, Lord have mercy. We, when I say we, I mean Westerners. I mean us Americans. Because I know, again, I know my audience is broader than that. I'm talking about Americans when I say we. We as Americans, we raise our children on a steady diet of fairy tales. I kid you not. From the time we are infants, we are fed fairy tales here in America. Okay? But I stop by to tell you, that marriage is not a bulletproof shield. I know that when you go out in life, you think, but Prophet Taylor, I'm married. <laughs> we married. I understand that. But that doesn't mean that it's a bulletproof shield. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Marriage is not a ticket to happily ever after. There is no guarantee that you're going to live to see old age just because you're married. There is no guarantee you're going to live to see old age with that person, just because you're married. There's no guarantee that you or your partner won't have an affair. There is no guarantee that you uh, won't get a divorce. Okay? And while I'm here, let me just throw this out. Stop wasting your money on books that say how to divorce-proof your marriage, how to affair-proof your marriage. No. There's no such thing. Do not spend money on books like that. Okay, why? Because God's wife cheated on him. God's wife was not faithful to him. God's wife made love to other gods right in his face. Okay, God's wife was not faithful to him, number one. Number two, God got a divorce. How are you going to tell me you can affair-proof your marriage when God's wife wasn't faithful to him? How are you going to tell me you can divorce-proof your marriage when God got a divorce? Why do you think Gentiles carry the gospel? Because God got a divorce. That's why. So stop wasting your money on a book talking about how to affair-proof your marriage. Marriage is not a bulletproof shield. There's no guarantee that you are going to live to be old just because you married. There's no guarantee you're going to be with the person then, if you do see old age, that you're with now. Just because you're married right now, there's no guarantee that you or your partner won't have an affair because you still have free will. Remember I told you in the first two, marriage doesn't take away your free will. And there's no guarantee that you're going to go the distance. There's no guarantee that, that you're going to stay with that person till death do you part. There's no guarantee of that 
just because you bought a certificate and you rented out a hall or you rented out a church and you had a ceremony. There's no guarantee of that, okay? Because marriage is not a bulletproof shield. God's wife cheated on him. God got a divorce. Marriage is not a bulletproof shield, okay? That's fairy tales. That's why that's what we think it is, but that's not actually what it is, okay? All right, so that was number four. Here come number five. Marriage is not a God to be worshipped, okay? Some people only see themselves through the eyes of a relationship, like it's your source of self-worth. I stop by to tell you that you were not born married. <laughs> you were born you. You're you, whether or not you ever choose to become a spouse. But a lot of people see their complete self-worth. You know folks like that, folks like that, their brothers that just got to have a girlfriend, their brothers have just got to be late. They feel like, well, if I ain't getting no sex, I'm not really a man. Really? Okay, let me tell you something. There were a lot of single people in the Bible that did great things. Elijah, Elisha, Daniel, John the Baptist, Jesus Christ himself, and Apostle Paul. None of them people were married. But you let somebody get it in your head that the measure of your manhood is how many women you're betting. That would make all those men abject failures. See, you've seen yourself through the eyes of your relationship. And there's a whole lot of women who feel like, well, if I'm not married, I'm not worth anything, or no man wants me, or I can't accomplish anything with my life. That's not true. You were not born married. You were born you. When you formed in your mother's belly, you were born you. You were somebody. You're someone in particular, custom designed by God to do what he created you to do, whether or not that includes marriage. But some people, instead of worshiping God, instead of worshiping your creator, you worship your, your marital relationship. You feel like if I'm not getting laid, if I'm not getting married, if that's not the state of my life, then I'm worthless. That's not the truth. That is not the truth. That is not what marriage is, an indicator of your self-worth. That is not what marriage is, but that is what we think it is. Okay? And so here comes number six. So quick review. When you got married, you thought you bought yourself a servant. You thought you bought yourself a slave. You thought marriage was a personality cure. You thought it was a ticket to happily ever, ever after. And you think marriage is a God to be worshipped. Well, here come number six. Last one. Number six is kind of the flip of number five. And that is a lot of people don't take their marriage vows seriously. So the one before, people take marriage too seriously. But in this one, people don't take it seriously enough. You can't stand up there before God and clergy and family and friends and take vows and then think them vows don't mean anything. Ecclesiastes 5.5 5 says, It's better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. And that's what a whole lot of people don't understand. They don't take their marriage vows seriously. You think you were just up there saying words. No. You was up there taking vows before God Almighty, and God takes vows seriously. That's what was up with God and Jonah. If you ever read the story of Jonah, uh, you, you know uh, the story of Jonah as Jonah gets swallowed by the whale and being in the whale's belly for three days, and then he went and preached to the Ninevites because he didn't want to go. Well, you have to read the whole book. Jonah 2.9 is where Jonah says, I will pay my vows to the Most High. So in other words, God and Jonah had entered into a covenant, and Jonah told God, I'll prophesy, I'll be your prophet, I'll be your mouthpiece to the people. And God said, fine, go preach to the Ninevites. And Jonah said, I don't want them to be saved. I want them people to go to hell. I ain't preaching to them. And he ran. That's when God sent the whale after him. Because God and Jonah had already made vows. You can't take vows. That's why I keep, oh Lord, that's why I keep trying to tell people. You better not make a marriage vow if you don't plan on upholding it. Just stay single. That would be better. It would be better for you to stay single than it is for you to stand before God and clergy and family and friends and the state and, and, and your country and take vows because you said, I do, I will, I take. I do, I take, I will. I will, I take, I do. And then you got home across your arms and you said, I don't. You're in trouble. Okay? It's better that you shouldn't make a vow than you should vow and not pay. How do I know you're in trouble? Because of Malachi 3 5. You are a false swearer. You are a perjurer. You are someone that lied under oath. Okay? Malachi 3 5. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament. And God says this 
uh, Malachi 3, 5 from the Berean Study Bible. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers and adulterers and perjurers, against oppressors of the widowed and fatherless, and against those who defraud laborers of their wages and deny justice to the foreigner, but do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Wow. I could spend all night just on that verse. But God said he's going to draw near to you for judgment. He's going to be a swift witness. God said, I'm going to hurry up and testify against you if you are a sorcerer or an adulterer or a perjurer. So in other words, don't sit up there and make the marriage vows and then think you don't have to keep them. Because God himself said he's going to draw near you in judgment. Just stay single. <laughs> if you know you don't want to be faithful, don't get married. If you know you don't want one person, now you're still going to have to pay consequences for a fornicator's life. That's a different conversation. and I'm not condoning that. I'm not saying do that. I'm just saying if you already know from the jump <laughs> that you have no intention of keeping your marriage vows, don't make any. Just stay single. Do something else. Because it's better that you should not vow than you should vow and not pay. Because God himself said he's going to be a swift witness against perjurers. That means people that lied under oath. You perjure yourself. You took an oath, but you lied. If you sit up there and you said, I do, I will, I take, then you don't get to go home and then say, well, well I don't. You're a liar. Okay? So, so we're going to review and then that's what's going to get us to the first choke point. I know we're just at the first choke point. Uh, before I get to tell you what marriage is, I have to tell you what it's not. Uh, marriage is not what we think it is. Uh, number one, you think you bought yourself a servant. Number two, you think you bought yourself a slave. Number three, you think it's a personality cure. You think you're going to fix them or they're going to fix you. Number four, you think it's, it's a ticket to happily ever after. It's some kind of guarantee of a future. Number five, you think it's a God to be worshipped. And number six, you don't take your vow seriously. Okay? Those six things are what we think marriage is. That is not what it is, which leads me to the first choke, first choke point. And no, I'm not misstating that. I'm actually meaning to say the word choke point. So let me show you what I mean. Uh, Revelation 4.11. Revelation is the last book in the New Testament, and it's the last book in the Bible. Okay? Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Here's the whole key. Revelation 4.11 out of King James. For thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Oh my goodness. Berean Study Bible. You are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. By your will they exist and came to be. New Living Translation, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. Holy cow! That's the first choke point for all of creation. What do I mean by choke point? Why do I keep saying that? I mean that, like when you drive on the highway, and if you have, you know, three lanes, four lanes, five lanes, six lanes, and then it bottlenecks, or you come to a toll, then the traffic kind of chokes through a smaller thing, and you either are going to get through that or you're not, okay? So by choke point, what I mean very specifically is that you are either going to get past the fact that he is God and you are not, or you won't. And that's going to determine the rest of your existence. That's why it's a choke point. You are either going to accept and understand that for his pleasure, he created all things. And for his pleasure, they are and were created, or you won't. If you don't understand that, then you're going to spend the rest of your life running around trying to make all this stuff out here work the way you think it should work. And it doesn't work the way you think it should work because you didn't invent it. But if you can't get past the fact that he is God and you are not. And that everything that exists, he thought it up. 
and then he designed it, and then he created it, and then he holds it all together. He is God, and we are not. That's why all that stuff I just told you about marriage, all that's what we think, as if we invented it. And so, step number one that you've got to deal with if you want to save your marriage is you're going to have to come to the point where you understand everything I said tonight. The four laws that govern our existence. you got a choice between life or death, good or evil. Choices have consequences. You get locked in them. You don't live in a vacuum. Your actions affect other people, and you have to give an account. No, those four things. Then you have to understand all the stuff that marriage is not. You did not buy yourself a servant, or you think you bought yourself a slave, or you think it's a personality cure, or you think it's a ticket to a guaranteed future, or you think it's a God to be worshipped, but you don't take it seriously. It's going to take you all of that understanding to get to Revelation 4.11. That everything that exists was created and thought up by God. That means... It doesn't work the way we think it should work. And it doesn't have to. You can spend... Have you ever tried to explain technology to somebody that don't understand technology? Like, like a pad or a tablet or a smartphone? You go and say, well, you know, you got to swipe here. You got to hit this app. You got, and they say, well, why I got to do it that way? Why can't I just do this? <laughs> you ever had that conversation with somebody that just didn't, didn't get... Why can't I just press this button? How can I? And you're like, I, I don't know. I, I didn't build it. <laughs> I just know that if you want to get it to do what you want it to do, you got to you know, swipe, you got to open this app, you got to do this. That's the way it works. Okay? Well, if you don't get past the fact that he is God and you are not, and that everything that was created is his idea, and not only is it his idea and his design, but he's actually the one that holds it all together. If you don't get past that, you are going to spend the rest of your life trying to make life work the way you think it should work, as if you invented it. Okay? All right. So that's all for this week. That's part one. I'll say my marriage. I know that's a lot. And there's so much more to say, but I had to lay that foundation first. So like I said, you're going to have to watch this video multiple times to get everything you need to get out of it, okay? So I just got us to the first first choke point. And the first choke point is understanding that he is God and we are not. That marriage does not work the way we think it should work because it's not our invention. And if you can't get past that, you ain't going to never have a good marriage. That's right. I'm saying that very definitively. If you can't get past the fact that God is the inventor of marriage, you ain't going to never have a good marriage. Count on it. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so now, if I have any prayer requests, if there's any prayer requests, because remember, I'm just getting started on this marriage thing. If there's any prayer requests, I'll put them on the screen now if you want me to pray for anything. Put them up there now. Got any prayer requests? Okay? Now, when you see me close my, close my eyes, I'm listening to the Holy Ghost. And I'm asking the Holy Ghost, is there anybody out there that needs physical healing? Okay, so let me do that. Okay, the Holy Ghost is telling me that somebody looking at me has a headache. So do this. Put your hand on your forehead and say, in the name of Jesus, I speak peace to my head. I speak peace to my brain because by his stripes, I am healed. And I speak peace Okay, and tranquility to my head. And you'll feel the power, yeah, see, I feel it as I'm saying it. You'll feel the power of God begin to flow through your head and your headache will go away. Okay, the Holy Ghost has shown me there's somebody out there where your pinky finger on your left hand is hurting. Put your hand, put your right hand on your pinky finger and say, in the name of Jesus, I command my pinky to be straight. I command my pinky to be every whit whole. By his stripes, the stripes of Jesus Christ, I am healed. Do that. Put your hand right on your pinky and say those words. And you'll feel the healing power of God flow into your hand as you do that. Okay? Oh, yes. Okay, the Holy Ghost is telling me that we need to rebuke the spirit of pride. 
So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I rebuke the spirit of pride. I rebuke the spirit that has been telling us as Christians that marriage is supposed to go the way we think. We have been taking God's invention and trying to have our way with it. That is pride. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I confess my pride. I confess my pride before the Lord. And I rebuke the spirit of pride that no longer will we try to tell God how marriage is supposed to go as if we invented it. No longer are we going to try to glorify ourselves in a marriage because marriage is, was not our invention. It was not created by us. It was not created according to our design specs. It was not created to glorify us. But like everything else, it was created to glorify him. So from this day forward, those of you that are watching this broadcast, broadcast, watching it live, or watching the replay, I rebuke the spirit of pride, and you need to get the pride out of your head, get the pride out of your heart, get the pride out of your life. Stop trying to tell the maker how marriage is supposed to go. That is the spirit of pride. That is a spirit of pride. And I break and rebuke the spirit of pride right now in the name of Jesus Christ. No longer will we try to tell God how marriage is supposed to work as if we invented it. No, God, no longer will we try to tell God how women are supposed to work as if we invented women. No longer will we tell God how men are supposed to work as if we invented men. We will no longer be arrogant, idolatrous blasphemers speaking against things that we know not of, but we're going to crucify our thoughts and our ideas and our pride and try to do it our way. And we're going to surrender that we might learn from God, the creator of all things in the name of Jesus. Okay, let me see if the spirit of God has any parting prophetic words uh, I'm supposed to leave. For behold, my people, says the Lord, it's a brand new day. You have an opportunity to come and sit at my feet and learn of me. I will teach you why I invented marriage. I will teach you how marriage works. I will teach you how to glorify me in your marriage. And you will discover that my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You will discover that you have been laboring under burdens you didn't have to labor under. You've been trying to do things you didn't have to do, my people. I'm here to love you. I'm here to lift all of your ideas, lift all of your burdens, lift the hard and oppressive yoke and set you free to learn, love, grow and become all that I created you to be in the context of marriage. So come and learn of me, says the Lord Jesus Christ, by the spirit of the living God. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Just wow. Just ain't no other word for that, but wow. I can't I ain't, can't even say none of that, but wow. Okay? All right. Thank you. God bless you. That's all for tonight. I know I gave you a lot of information. So, again, I want you to like and share this video. Uh, you're going to need to watch it multiple times. When I come on next month in February, we're going to pick up with part two, and I'm going to talk about consequences. Okay? I'm going to talk about the consequences of, because I'm going to show you in the Bible where God actually tells us relationship stuff but we know from personal experience and from personal observation, we don't always listen. So next time I come in and I talk about Save My Marriage, we're going to be talking about some of the choices we've made and the consequences thereof. Okay? All right, so remember, I'll be here on Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Remember to like and share this video. Also, if you're on Facebook, click uh, on the sign-up button so you get on my alert list. No spam on my alert list, but I just want to let you know when I have new material coming out. Okay? Thank you so much. God bless you. We're, we're moving onward and upward and forward to better godly marriages in the name of Jesus. Amen. Have a great rest of your week.